Hello, thank you for joining us for NABA Chat. I'm Jeannie Horton, NABA Vice President. Our presenter today is Marianne Borge. Marianne is a naturalist, photographer, author, and educator. She is the editor of NABA's magazine, Butterfly Gardener. Welcome, Marianne. So glad you could join us on the Zoom event today. Well, as I was saying while we were just chit-chatting there, I optimistically began by saying it's spring, but I don't know. The last couple of days here, it's been spring here in the Northeast in New Jersey is quite variable, so you just never know. Um, but it's coming and there's a lot of things in bloom already. So let's just talk about um, what, um, could you, anyone who's not me, would you please mute? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so spring in a butterfly garden, what should we be doing? Um, probably a lot less than you think. Um, I don't know, there's something about the way we've been raised and taught to think about our gardens that we really need to be busy doing things, cleaning, tidying, whatever. And really some of the things we said in the fall still continue to hold true now. Um, like if you left the leaves and other decomposing plant matter in your garden in the fall, keep doing that because the benefit has not gone away. Um, <laughs> please mute if you're not me. <laughs> Please mute um, your sound, everybody. Uh, please mute your sound. Okay. Um, anyway, the decomposing leaves, the leaves will continue to decompose as this weeks and seasons move on. We often think that those delicate spring flowers need our help getting through the blanket of leaves. Not true at all. Those delicate little creatures are a lot tougher than we think. So keep leaving the leaves. They're a blanket for your plants. Um, here where I live in New Jersey, the weather's very variable. One day it's 70, 75, the next day it's 45. And those leaves actually continue to protect the plants. Not only that, but they will continue to decompose. They will provide the nutrients that your plants need. So just leave them. Whatever the urges are, whatever we were taught when we were younger, we don't need to remove those leaves. Leave them there. Um, the spent perennials may be continuing to provide shelter for either butterflies or other insects that are trying to survive, so continue to leave those. If they really bother you, you could cut them and drop them in place in the garden. Um, you could cut them and add them to a brush pile. Um, one piece of advice that I saw just in the last few days was to cut them, you know, maybe 12 to 18 inches above the ground level, if the plant was tall enough to begin with to do that, and um, leave the remainder of the stems standing because then that provides an opening for insects that like to nest inside of stems. So there's a lot of things that we can do if we want, but we shouldn't do as much cleaning as we think we should. One thing that I do every spring is to identify and remove the non-native invasive species that pop up in the garden. Um, there was one in my garden just a couple of days ago, lesser celandine here where I live. It's quite an invasive plant. And um, I thought I got it all last year, but apparently a little bit remains. So I got it again. Um, spring garlic mustard is a big invasive species. And again, in my garden, um, I have a shade garden, there are a lot of trees around, and some of them are native, some of them are not native. Um, Norway maple is one that crops up in my garden a lot, so I always try to get the seedlings and pull them out. So it's a good time to look for things that you don't want to have in your garden, that you really, that shouldn't be there. Look for those emerging invasives and get rid of them now before they really get a, a, a hold in the ground. And then another thing you could do is if you find you have a lot of plants, maybe more than you need of some species, share them with your friends. Make room for some new plants that you're going to add this year because you've got an idea about uh, what you'd like to add. Um, again, the, leaving the leaves in the spent perennial habitat, the leaves act uh, like sponges and slowly release the water into the soil. It, it's they're more effective than the mulch that you would buy. Not only that, but you're saving energy and uh, both your own and fossil fuel, which these days is a really important thing to do. And it saves you money too. So 
what do we want to think about if we're, you know, what should we be doing? What if we want to, what's in the garden? We want to add more plants. We want to see more butterflies in our gardens. What should we do to achieve that goal? Well, one thing is to think holistically, learn a little bit about the butterflies and their whole life cycle and understand what they need throughout that life cycle. That understanding led us to some of the things that I just talked about, which is leave the leaves, leave the spent perennials. That provides shelter for them. Um, when we think about adding plants, that's great. Add plants that are native to your region. They're most likely to provide the most benefit to the most insects and birds that you're cohabiting with, including the butterflies. Um, make sure that you're adding plants, not just for nectar and adult butterflies, but for their kids. Um, think about yourself when you're, you know, thinking about moving to a new neighborhood or you're um, going on a trip. Do you think about just the adults or do you think about, you know, everyone who's involved in the move and what they might need in order to be successful and happy? So think about the kids, in this case, the caterpillars, as well as the adult butterflies. And we'll talk about it. We'll I'll just go through a few examples. There's so many, it can't possibly be exhausted, but exhaustive, but I will go through a few examples. And when you think about adding plants to your garden, to your um, backyard, to your um, lot, however big it is or small, consider adding a mix of herbaceous and uh, woody plants, herbaceous plants being those that die back to the ground, the above ground parts um, die back at the end of the season. The woody plants are shrubs, they may be vines, they may be um, trees. Turns out that they play an important role in the life of many butterflies. So we'll, we'll look at a few examples of those. Whatever you do, don't use pesticides, use natural pest control. And by that I mean, have enough variety of native plants in your garden or in your yard or on your property to attract a mix of critters, insects, birds, and other critters who will help to keep the undesirable, um, or the insects that you would prefer not to see in your garden. Um, that would help to keep them under control. And I'll give you a few examples of that later too. And whatever you do, don't be too neat. Um, don't be so neat. I, I think the rest of nature looks at um, neatness differently from human beings. We seem to be tidier and like more order and the rest of many other species have a different notion of what that is. So I think we need to be cognizant of that and try to accommodate those other species in our um, in the, the places where we can. So where I live, again, I live in New Jersey. One of the first uh, spring bloomers that I see is spring beauty. It's one of the first things I see emerging. I'll see the, uh, the, the spring beauty that I mostly see around here is uh, Claytonia virginica, um, which has very narrow leaves. I met the other spring beauty on a visit to uh, Vermont one time and was excited to see the difference in the foliage finally. I didn't really understand it until then, which has a pair of leaves on either side. Um, but the spring beauty that's native here where I live has long grass-like leaves, um, lovely sort of open bowl-shaped flowers that make a nice landing place for all kinds of insects, including butterflies. And it does offer nectar, so it would be appealing to butterflies. Not all the spring bloomers offer nectar. They're more targeting um, bees and flies as their potential partners in pollination. But you can see spring beauties advertising, hey, I've got nectar here, come feed. It's got sort of um, striping that varies from a pale pink, almost white, to a deep pink with sort of yellow smudges here at the throat. All of that is like a landing platform for pollinators, including the butterflies, to say, um, nectar is available here. And I do see all kinds of insects drinking nectar from spring beauty first thing in the spring when the flowers are open on the warmer days, unlike today. Um, for example, this juvenile's dusky wing. So however, if you want to see juvenile's dusky wing, this butterfly leaves of oaks. So there need to be oak trees nearby. And in fact, spring beauty is um, a species that you'll often see in woodland understories, but that will also creep out into your lawn and it makes a, a great addition to your lawn too. So 
Juvenile dusky wing likes to drink nectar, but their caterpillars like to eat the leaves, need to eat the leaves of oak trees. Um, I'm fond of pussy toes for whatever reason. I just like them. Um, they're really cute. They're, uh, this particular species, it, which is um, plantain-leaved pussy toes, has leaves that are sort of semi-evergreen, and some of the older, larger leaves that we see here are left over from the previous season. Um, as the new leaves emerge, so do the flowers, and these are, in fact, the flowers. Um, I always find it interesting that for this species, male and female flowers are on separate plants, and yet the plant also reproduces through its underground root system, so it can um, spread to make a nice ground cover. This is the food, a food plant, one of the food plants for American lady caterpillars. They um, specialize on the pussy toes and also everlastings and cudweeds. So the kids need to eat the leaves of these types of species. The adult butterflies drink nectar from a variety of different plants. And uh, a couple of them that I've captured American lady on are pickerel weed, which if you have a pond, I can't be enthusiastic enough about this plant for an addition to your pond. It's got spikes of sort of blue-violet flowers and they continue to bloom throughout the summer, basically. They start sometime in June and will continue to bloom through most of the summer. So they're really fantastic to have if you have a wet site. They do like ponds, edges, and things like that for their habitat. Not something that I have on my shade garden up in the Sourly Mountains in New Jersey, but I do see it in other places where I like to go out and play. So um, it's good, a good addition for a pond type area. Um, another plant that I'll talk about a little bit more later is Indian hemp, which is um, a nectar plant here at least where I live in June when there's not as much other uh, variety of plants blooming. So Indian hemp, which we'll see again a little bit later. But the adult butterflies, Yep, definitely looking for nectar, but where you're mostly going to see them, I, again, um, butterflies need to accommodate their entire family. They want to survive and they want to reproduce. And in order to be successful in reproduction, they have to have food for their kids. So they're going to be found in habitats where they can find food both for the adults and the caterpillars. Can't talk about spring without talking about violets. Violets are you know, synonymous with spring for me. And um, they're great little plants. They make wonderful ground covers. They're great for lots of pollinators, but their special appeal for butterflies is that they're food plants for the caterpillars of many of the fritillary butterflies, including the great spangled fritillary that we see here. Wild geranium is a lovely spring bloomer um, in this area. Um, we see here, again, it has sort of that open bowl-shaped flower that accommodates lots of different pollinators, including the butterflies that like to land on them and drink nectar. And this is a, a lovely sort of um, understory plant. It can tolerate part shade very well. Um, this is a spring azure, by the way, one of the earliest butterflies that I see, not necessarily the earliest, um, spring azures survive the winter in the pupal stage, so it doesn't take them too long to get going in the spring. They're among the earliest that we see, and it's really wonderful to see that little fleck of blue flitting about in the woods. So they like nectar, the females in particular. The males you'll often see um, looking for minerals. Uh, you'll see them feeding on bird poop, um, moist soil to get minerals. The females are especially fond of nectar. The caterpillars will actually um, typically eat the flowers of many different species of plants, especially some of the shrubs. Um, here I've seen them, uh, this little spring azure is about to lay an egg on the flower buds of uh, gray dogwood, one of the dogwood shrubs. Um, this other little spring azure is about to lay eggs on uh, the buds of nine bark, which is another wonderful shrub. So they tend to lay their eggs on shrubs um, in, in the spring, woody species. One of the interesting fun facts about azure butterflies is that they have a partnership with ants. Ants will work for food, they're mercenaries, and they have an eclectic 
diet. They like to drink sweet things and also like to eat insects. And in some scenarios, ants will actually protect plants from caterpillars by eating the caterpillars. In other scenarios, like that of the azure butterflies, they protect the caterpillar because the caterpillar is producing um, a sweet honeydew, an excrement that the ants like to eat. So they, um, they actually take care of or tend the ant, uh, the caterpillars rather, and protect them. Uh, another plant, they might be eating them. So it's interesting. Pay them off enough and they'll work for you. Uh, that nine bark that was um, being used as a place to lay eggs by the spring azure a couple of slides ago, when in bloom, has it's a, it's a rose family member and it has lovely clusters of white flowers with um, red anthers at the tips, which is what, where the uh, pollen is dispersed. It sort of offset it to make them just especially lovely. They're beautiful clusters of these um, tiny flowers that provide nectar for lots of different insects, including the red admiral that we're seeing here. So shrubs can be a benefit both for nectar and as a caterpillar food plant. So consider some shrubs. Other dogwoods, uh, almost ready to bloom here, I'd say it's another week to 10 days, is flowering dogwood, um, which we see here. I'm gonna ask a trick question. Does anybody know how many flowers we're seeing here? Feel free to type it in the chat or not. No? Okay, I'm just gonna tell you. Um, so this is a flower cluster from flowering dogwood. And these white things, many in the center, yep, Consuelo, you remember your lessons very well, thank you. Um, these big white things that look like petals are actually bracts or they had been, they were bud scales in the winter and they were protecting the cluster of flowers that's in the center. So these little less conspicuous things in the middle, those are really the flowers. So again, there's a cluster of flowers that pollinators can feed on, including um, butterflies. And this is another potential location for eggs to be laid by the spring azure butterflies. Other dogwoods that are great, um, silky dogwood and red twig dogwood, which is not pictured here, um, are both shrub uh, size plants. They typically would get to about 10 feet or so. And they have clusters of small white flowers that bloom in the spring. So nectar for lots of insects, including butterflies, and are also potential caterpillar food plants for the azure butterflies. And sort of an understory tree or shrub, I see it mostly as a single stemmed species, is alternate leaf dogwood. And you can see that the dogwoods do get fruit in the fall, so they're, um, they're a benefit to birds too and other animals later in the season. Um, my personal favorite viburnum is black hawk viburnum. It blooms at about the same time, maybe just a few days later than flowering dogwood. And again, you have a cluster of small white flowers offering nectar to lots of different pollinators, um, including butterflies, and the buds are potential food for the azure butterflies. Um, you do want to be a little careful with the viburnums. There are some that are not native that have become invasive. And these are the two that I recommend that you do not plant. Um, I've listed several others that are also good candidates to plant that are native. Um, you know, depending on where you live, there might be a different mix of species. Again, another plug for a woody species, this time um, a vine. The pipe vine swallowtail is just a lovely butterfly and a delight to have in your garden. They specialize on a few other related plants. Where I live, it's Dutchman's pipe vine, um, which is, as the name implies, a vine and is a great species to cover um, a fence, an arbor. It's, it's uh, quite prolific in its spread when it's happy in its location. And it is named after the shape of its flowers, um, which look a little bit like a pipe. Um, these flowers are just in bud. When they're open, there's a little uh, opening here just where you would expect the smoke to be coming out of the pipe. These flowers are not of interest for nectar at all for butterflies. It's totally the leaves that are of interest for 
the caterpillar food. Um, and much like monarchs and milkweeds, pipevine swallowtails specialize on the pipevines because of their toxicity. The, um, they are aerosologic acids that protect the plant from being eaten by very many herbivores, uh, yeah, herbivores, sorry. That is critters that would like to eat plants typically. Like you don't see deer browsing on this. Um, the protection that's provided by the aerosologic acids are sequestered in the pipeline swallowtail's body, much like the monarchs are protected by the chemicals that they get from milkweeds. So it's a good deal, you know, it's, it's worth um, specializing to get that level of protection. Um, the females lay their eggs. They seem to prefer um, newly emerging foliage as the place to lay their eggs. It's possible that the um, that protective chemical is less intense in the newer foliage, so it's easier for newly hatched caterpillars to eat. Um, typically, a, a cluster of maybe 15 or 20 eggs are laid in one location. And when the caterpillars hatch, initially they feed in a group, as you see on the left here. Eventually they sort of head off on their own and uh, um, feed individually. And you can see that in both cases, in whatever instar you see, um, there's not really an attempt so much to blend in with the foliage, much like with the monarchs, they're sort of advertising their toxicity. The pipevine swallowtails are doing the same thing. Like, hey, don't bother, don't, you know, if you take a bite, you'll be sorry, and that'll be the last bite you'll take. So uh, again, a very similar strategy to the, the monarch butterflies. That strategy is so successful that um, other butterflies are thought to have evolved to mimic the coloration of the pipevine swallowtail. One of the potential mimics is the spicebush swallowtail, which we can see here has a very similar coloration to the pipevine swallowtail. And this pair is featured here drinking nectar from bottlebrush buckeye, which is sort of a July bloomer, at least in my yard. Spice bush is really my, I have so many favorite plants. This is one of my favorite plants. This is a, an early spring bloomer. Um, this is uh, a shrub. It blooms at about the same time as forsythia, but it has so much more value and entertainment value for you than forsythia does. It has these lovely flowers that are attracted to lots of different pollinators, including again, a spring azure. Um, if the flowers are pollinated, they produce fruit that is a uh, important food for birds later in the season and um, typically September. It's also the food that the spice bush swallowtail caterpillars survive the best on. They can also eat sassafras leaves, but they don't thrive as well. So it's really spice bush that is the primary food plant for spice bush swallowtail caterpillars. Um, the caterpillars try to protect themselves from being eaten in lots of different ways. Um, when they're very young, the earliest instars, they're, um, they try to mimic bird poop because what bird would want to eat bird poop and birds are the most likely predators of these insects. To look a bit like snakes to scare off again, the birds who would be potentially wanting to eat them because again, caterpillars are really an important source of food for birds. They're also able to create little shelters for themselves. They can spin silk. I don't know how well you can see it, but on the base of this leaf, this caterpillar has spun some silk that as it dries can draw the pieces, the sides of the leaf together to create a nice shelter. The other thing, I thought this was a really neat trick. So I've learned that looking for caterpillars, if I look for leaves that have little munch holes in them, I might be successful in finding a caterpillar. Another common butterfly around my area is Eastern Tiger Swallowtail, a pretty prolific butterfly. I haven't seen as many as I usually do, and I have to wonder if it has anything to do with um, the demise of one of its uh, caterpillar food plants, which I'll talk about in a minute. But meanwhile, uh, one of the early nectar sources that I've seen it use is common blackberry or wild blackberry, which are brambles that are very appealing to lots of different butterflies. Now they're not necessarily, you know, the um, perfect choice for every garden, but if you have more of a natural area, they're really great. They really provide nectar. I've seen insects 
preferentially select common blackberry to drink from as opposed to the non-native multiflora rose that might be growing right next to it. So it's a great source of nectar early in the summer, late spring, like um, May to early June. Okay. Um, now, the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail uses a number of different woody species trees as their caterpillar food. They um, have somewhat eclectic tastes here. Wild cherry is one of them. Tulip trees, this is the flower, uh, is another. Uh, Sweet babe magnolia is another. And hop trees, uh, the lower right here, is another potential food plant for the caterpillars of Eastern Tiger Swallowtail. Um, and I was always entertained years ago when I would see them flying really up in the trees thinking, what's that butterfly doing up there? But most likely they were looking for a good place to lay eggs. Now, another possible food plant for Eastern Tiger Swallowtail is another group of trees, the ash trees. And where I live, the emerald ash borer is killing a lot of ash trees. So I have to wonder if that plays into the reason I have been seeing fewer Eastern Tiger Swallowtails over the last few years. Um, not only are the ash trees dying, but some ash trees are being treated with pesticides to try to kill the emerald ash borer and save the tree. An understandable strategy, but using a pesticide on a tree is not going to just kill that one species of insect. It'll have a negative effect on any insect that's feeding on that tree. So um, it's something to be avoided, I think. That's my preference. I do get it if it's a specimen tree right next to your house. I totally understand, but I don't know. Pesticides have a lot of negative um, effects. Uh, that business about mimicking the pipevine swallowtail, there is a dark form of the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail. This is sort of a lightish version of it, but they do get very dark. Um, that again, tries to, is thought to mimic the coloration of the pipevine swallowtail. And they, the butterflies presumably do get some protection from that. It's just the female Eastern Tiger Swallowtails that sometimes have this dark coloration. And it's thought to be more common in areas where the pipevine swallowtail is common. I'm going to mention a tree as a potential addition to your, your home, to your property, and that's hackberry. Um, I just like it. It has really cool bark. It has this quirky looking bark, very easy to identify. But then it's the food plant for the caterpillars of the hackberry emperor, who was named after their dependence on the, uh, this species and a couple of others closely related. Um, as its caterpillar food. Now the butterflies themselves are not big nectar drinkers. They're more into minerals and they um, feed mostly on rotting stuff or maybe um, minerals from your sweat, maybe mud. Um, I'm not quite sure what they were getting from the hood of this vehicle, but probably some minerals. Um, they're, so they're not that likely to drink nectar. So providing nectar plants aren't gonna bring this butterfly to your property, but providing their caterpillar food is much more likely to provide, uh, to bring this, uh, this butterfly to your property. And it's not just the hackberry emperor, the tawny emperor also uses hackberry as their caterpillar food. And not just the tawny emperor, but the American snout, who can resist that little nose-ish thing. Um, it's such a quirky looking little butterfly, so cute. This butterfly does drink nectar and it's uh, visiting a mountain mint right now for some uh, nectar, but the caterpillar food, hackberry. Question mark, they use hackberries. They'll also use elms. Uh, morning cloaks, they use a number of different species, including hackberries. So I, I like hackberries, yay hackberry, consider adding one. Um, milkweeds, of course, are a necessity if you've got enough sun, think about some milkweeds. The three species that are most common where I live are common milkweed, butterfly weed, and um, swamp milkweed. And they, they bloom in that order. Common milkweed is the earliest bloomer um, in my area, and it's typically a June bloomer. Late June, July, butterfly weed will begin. And then um, later July and August, we'll see swamp milkweed. So these are all great selections. And as you know, I'm sure, um, they, not only are they great nectar plants, 
but they're the required caterpillar food for the monarch butterflies. Oops. There's a, I mentioned uh, Indian hemp in passing a little few minutes ago, and mon I'm sorry, milkweed is actually in the Indian hemp family. They're very closely related, and they have a lot of the same chemical characteristics, but they're not similar enough for uh, monarchs to be able to use them as caterpillar food. But they are great nectar plants uh, in early summer when not a lot of other things are blooming. They're typically, I see them in June, into July, sometimes into August, but it's that June time frame, that seems to be the time that I have the hardest time, you know, making sure that we have enough nectar. So Indian hemp is something to consider. Um, it has small white flowers or white-ish flowers that are bell-shaped, and they are appealing to lots of different pollinators. We already saw American ladies drinking from them. We'll see a few other species in a minute. Um, this is a gray hair streak, a sweat bee, and okay, as if that wasn't enough, they have this really cute little beetle called a dog vein beetle that's named after them because the dog vein beetle is, um, uh, uses this as its food plant as well. And again, the chemistry of Indian hemp is similar enough that there are some other insects that you typically might associate with milkweed that will also use Indian hemp. This is um, the large milkweed beetle nymphs that are uh, hoping to get uh, their mouths on the seeds of Indian hemp. So it's kind of a cool plant. The silver spotted skipper is also drinking nectar from Indian hemp. And the silver spotted skipper is a common butterfly where I live. Um, it uses pea family members as caterpillar food. Blue false indigo, which we see on the left-hand side of the screen, and the American wisteria, which we see on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, the eggs are laid on the leaves. The caterpillars, again, are able to spin silk to pull leaves together to create a shelter for themselves to uh, hide so that they're not eaten by potential predators. Eastern tail blues are another species that um, depend on various pea family members as their caterpillar food, and they may be very common members, things like um, white clover that you have in your yard tick trefoils, which um, if anybody's ever gone for a walk in a natural area and come home with little triangular shaped seeds sticking to your pants, that's a tick trefoil. Those are caterpillar food for many different species of butterflies. This eastern tail blue is nectaring on some mountain mint, and I'll tell you a story about this because I was taking photographs of this little butterfly from different angles, and I was starting to move. I was starting to um, move my left foot over to get a different angle. When, um, much to my surprise, another little butterfly, an eastern tail blue, started flying over to my left, just in my field of vision, to get my attention, because I was just about to step on these two who were mating in the grass, a little bit of splendor in the grass. Um, so they were working together to look out for each other. And I thought that was pretty interesting too. Other butterflies that eat pea family members, um, the clouded sulfur, the orange sulfur, and the gray hair streaks. Uh, again, a lot of butterflies actually drink the nectar of white clover, not a native plant, but it's just so prolific and common. And it's actually good for your grass if you have it in, the, um, in your lawn, that I, I don't object to it. Um, tick tree foils, this, the group of plants I mentioned earlier that may, whose seeds may stick to your pants if you go for a walk through, the, through a meadow, is another potential caterpillar food. This little gray hair streak is just about to pop out an egg here at the tip there. Um, other pea family members that are caterpillar food, one of my personal favorites is wild senna, which is used by both the cloudless sulfur, which we see pictured here. Here she is about to lay an egg and the sleepy orange, which um, a few years back was pretty uncommon here in my area, but it's managed to uh, move north. Both the cloudless sulfur, I have to admit, the next couple of slides are just sort of gratuitous. They're really cute critters, and I just thought you should see them. They deserved an audience. Um, this lovely little cloudless sulfur is uh, a, this, a species that flies north in the winter when other Critters are flying south for warmer climates. The cloudless sulfur 
and uh, the sleepy orange both will fly north. I, I sort of imagine them getting together and saying, hey, you, you, and you, fly north. See if you can survive. If you can't, no big deal. None of us were going to live more than another few months anyway. But if you can, we've extended our territories. So they could be well positioned for climate change. And they can only do that because their caterpillar food is found further north, which allows them to expend, uh, extend their range. And this is the lovely caterpillar of the uh, clouded, cloudless sulfur, which blends in very well with the foliage of wild senna. Sleepy orange, um, the first time I reported it being seen here in central New Jersey on a, on a 4th of July butterfly count, I was asked to provide proof because it really shouldn't be here but it has been expanding its range. And that was, I don't know, about 10 years ago. And now it's relatively common. and People are seeing it reproducing in their own yards as long as they have the caterpillar food to support it. So pretty interesting what's going on. Partridge pea is um, an annual. Um, the other species that I've talked about are all perennials. This is an annual, but it reproduces pretty easily. Another pea family member, closely related to the wild senna, a lot of similarities. Um, I should mention that neither wild senna nor partridge pea flowers produce nectar. So you wouldn't plant them as nectar plants for butterflies. For um, you, could, you could provide them as food plants for other pollinators. Bees, for example, are the best pollinators for these plants and they eat pollen, not just nectar. So it's fine for them. You plant these plants as caterpillar food. Um, and one other thing that I found pretty interesting about this, I, I will say that when I, in my area, um, where I see the cloudless sulfur and the sleepy orange, if both wild senna and partridge pea are available, I see them selectively choosing the wild senna. Maybe that's just the local crop here. But one interesting, again, about both wild senna and partridge pea is that while the flowers don't produce nectar, they have what are called extra floral nectaries. They have these little glands on um, the leaves, basically, and, that produce nectar. And their primary purpose is to attract insects that are predators of insects that would be more likely to harm the plant. But I found it really interesting that this little gray hair streak was actually drinking nectar from this extra floral nectary. So it has a pretty broad appeal, the extra floral nectary. Um, just a few other early species, nectar early summer um, and late spring nectar plants are white or foxglove beard tongue. Um, there are a few other species of beard tongue also. If you're wondering where it gets these peculiar names, the foxglove beard tongue uh, is because of the fact that there are five petals that are, are fused into a tubular shape, but they look sort of like um, the fingers of a glove. And the beard tongue comes from the fact that there's at the base of this tube, there's a, a stamen, a male reproductive part that is sterile. It doesn't have any pollen associated with it, but it has a lot of hairs on it. So thus the name beard tongue. Um, it's thought that that might be a secondary method of distributing pollen. So if the pollen falls from anthers that are further up, that's another place that uh, the pollen may be picked up from um, the disturbance of the pollinators. Wild bergamot is, how could you not love that? It is a beautiful plant. It's a mint family member, very deer resistant. Um, drinking nectar here is a spice bush swallowtail butterfly. Uh, I couldn't do this without just giving a plug to the mountain mints, which I happen to love. My two personal favorite species are called either clustered or I prefer the name short tooth, but that's just me, mountain mint and hoary mountain mint. They both have um, their upper leaves just below the flower clusters, look like they're dusted with powdered sugar and the foliage is very pretty. Um, they both have small clusters or round clusters of small flowers that are very appealing to lots of butterflies and other pollinators, um, like this meadow fritillary and I think this was, I forget which skipper this was, but anyway, uh, appealing to lots of different butterflies. So don't use pesticide, use natural pest control. What do I mean by that? Well, make sure that you have enough of, of a variety of plants to attract a variety of other critters 
to your yard or garden to keep less desirable critters under control. Now, some of you may be put off by seeing these little critters here when they're aphids, of course. And what is your um, first reaction when you uh, see aphids? Is that something that you might like or that you might not? Is it, uh, I don't know, ew, aphids? Well, it turns out that they're actually an important source of food. Well, they're a source of food for other critters. This one little aphid is being eaten by two critters at once. It's being bit in the butt by the larva of a lady beetle. And if you can see this little sort of um, bubble-like thing, that is a sign of um, being eaten from the inside out by a braconid wasp. So two critters are eating this aphid at one time. They're also um, sort of a sustainable source of food for ants and the ants may help to protect the milkweeds. So just as the ants earlier were um, tending the caterpillars of the azure butterflies, here, they're tending the aphids to get honeydew, a, a sweet treat. Their presence on the, um, on the milkweed may help to protect the milkweed from other caterpillars. So an interesting trade-off. You may see tachnid flies. These little critters um, help to control things like stink bugs, which are often not such desirable creatures. They lay eggs on top of the insect and then the larva burrows inside and develops inside and eats the um, stink bug, for example, from the inside out. Assassin bugs have a different approach. They typically will grab their prey with their front legs and then they insert their proboscis and um, inject it with basically digestive enzymes that liquefy the inside of the insect, their prey and allows the assassin bug to slurp up the inside of the insect. I like to think that these, so this is a Japanese beetle that it has in its clutches. I like to think that the other Japanese beetles over here are uh, cowering in fear, but probably that's too optimistic. Um, another insect that keeps um, Japanese beetles in control or in check is this scolid wasp. Um, they actually seek out, so Japanese beetles, one good way to control them or to minimize them on your property is to minimize your lawn because the kind of place where they like to nest is lawn. Um, this insect, the scolid wasp, will actually seek out the nests of scarab beetles, including Japanese beetles, and lay their eggs in the nest. Their eggs hatch and eat the larva of the scarab beetle, the Japanese beetle hopefully. So, so who needs pesticides when you've got these other natural pest controls in your garden? Um, this is a bit of a repeat from the fall, but I think it's important enough to do it, to say it, because this hasn't changed. Butterfly populations are declining. Um, studies show it. Uh, the studies that NABA has done and other people as well and it's not just butterflies, other insect populations are also declining. And that's really important for everybody, for all living creatures. Um, insects are an important source of food for many other animals. They do a lot of the pollination that we need for our food supply. So without insects, we're in a world of hurt. Um, some of the other animals that depend on insects are birds. Insects are an important source of food for birds and their population have to, has declined dramatically in the last 50 years. Extreme weather is becoming the new normal. Um, you know, our springs have always been a little volatile, but we've never had weather where there's um, like five out of six days are gale force winds or um, just normal, uh, a, a normal rainstorm without it being associated with any kind of tropical system can result in flash flooding or um, river flooding. So um, out west, those of you out west are experiencing really bad droughts. I was just talking to uh, Jeff Glassberg a little while ago and he said he just got back from west Texas where they haven't had any rain in six months. I mean, that's pretty serious. 
they're out of control wildfires that um, are so big that they create their own weather systems, that the, wild, the, the smoke from the fire stretches across the country. Um, great, storms are getting more frequent and more um, volatile, or more dangerous. So the good news, however, is that each of us can take action to help reverse these trends. We need to do whatever we need to make the environment that we have any control over more um, hospitable to other creatures. And a, a lot of that is planting plants, less pavement, less grass, more other plants, more trees to help remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, help reduce temperatures and you know, help prevent the situation from getting any worse. So my advice is to use plants that are native to your region. They're gonna do the best in your area, in your region. And they're also gonna support the most other creatures that depend on them. Um, learn and use caterpillar food plants for butterflies. Learn about the whole butterfly life cycle. Don't just think nectar, think the whole life cycle. You know, again, think about your family. Would you just be feeding yourself or are you gonna make sure there's food for the kids? Um, make sure that you have enough of any given caterpillar food plant that the butterflies are able to detect it. And make sure that you provide shelter for them too. So that means leaving the leaves. That means leaving the spent perennials. That means having um, trees with shaggy bark. Uh, that means maybe having a brush pile. Um, make sure that you don't use pesticides, herbicides, and try to get rid of non-native invasive plants. The reason for that is that they're taking up space that more beneficial plants could be using that would be um, of benefit to them and allow them to live out their lifespan. So again, lose or diversify your lawn if you can. Minimize it and let other plants creep in. Don't have it be just grass. Um, some resources, especially if you're interested in learning more about plants that are native to your region, um, and, and what are the caterpillar food plants that the butterflies in your region might need. The field guides that are specific to your region should have some information about that. Um, in terms of native plants, check the Native Plant Society that's um, for your state or a province. The, there are three online databases where you can basically just put in your zip code or your state and it'll spit back uh, a list of recommended plants for your area. And that's Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, National Audubon Society and the National Wildlife Federation. And of course, don't forget NAVA and your local NAVA chapter for information about butterflies in your area, what caterpillar food they need and what other plants might be recommended. So what we do in our gardens makes a difference. We can all make a difference, I think. And I think it's important to try. So um, I wasn't really paying too much attention to the chat. Do we have any questions? Yeah, uh, Laura, I like assassin bugs too. They're kind of cool. And you can kind of understand where science fiction writers get their ideas from. Um, if anyone has any questions, I can look at the chat. Um, the aphids, typically when you have insects feeding on plants, um, usually, especially if they've evolved together, typically they'll take some of the energy of the plant. They might not, the plant might not be as robust as it would be if insects were not feeding on it. But you could say that about the caterpillars too. Those aphids um, are oleander aphids and they're really not native. Um, if you find them to be really problematic, you can always brush them off with your fingers or many people like to use a water spray to get rid of them. But I just wanted you to know that there are other insects out there helping you to control them. I wish we could give a round of applause for Marianne because this has just been wonderful. I know everybody feels like I do, but it's just been terrific. Okay. And I appreciate you taking a look at the chat and, and the questions. If you would like to ask our speaker a question, you can unmute yourself. And we have just a few more minutes where we have uh, Marianne with us. Thank you so much again. This has been terrific. Oh, you're welcome. Hope you enjoyed it. Oh, very much, very much. And your pictures are amazing. Oh my God. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Just wonderful. Thank you. Um, 
Anybody else have a question or a comment for Marianne? I'm also trying to look at the chat. Yeah. Um, how big and heavy does pipevine grow? Just does pipevine grow? It can get um, fairly big and heavy. Um, so you do want to have something substantial to put it on. It's especially good on a fence. It's great on a fence or a sturdy trellis would be good too. And it gets really kind of interesting bark. There was a, so I volunteered at Bowens Hill Wildflower Preserve, which is like five minutes from me. And I was, um, uh, I showed around a garden writer from the Philadelphia Inquirer in the winter one time, and she was kind of captivated by the interest of the bark and the uh, the sort of structure of the the um, Dutchman's mm -hmm. pipeline. So, anyway, that's great. Somebody else have a question? You and Diane, did you have a question? Oh no, no, sorry. <laughs> We're raising um, eastern tigers on our cherry. Good, good. Yeah, they do like cherry. And the one photo that I had in the center with the caterpillar, it was on a cherry leaf. Um, yeah, they're interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's really fun to look for caterpillars and to... Uh, um, actually, so, so I, I'm trying to look at the chat too for questions if anybody had them. Uh, leave the leaves. What about the pine needles? Can there be too many? Um, you know, when things are naturally fallen, typically there's not too many. Um, if you were, if you have a big yard with a lot of lawn and you're raking all of your leaves into your flower beds, that might end up being a little bit much. So you might want to think about a compost pile. Um, but if you've got a pine tree and the pine needles fall below it, that's fine. I mean, that's the kind of thing that will nurture that pine tree. Um, Someone just asked if this is recorded, and it is, and okay. it will be posted on NAVA's website here in the next couple of days. We have a YouTube channel now where you can see all of these talks, including the one Marianne did in the fall, and uh, we'll make these, uh, they're all available on the, on the NAVA site. Um, we're seeing, I'm seeing different opinions on the aphids in terms of how much they harm plants. You know, again, if there are insects feeding on plants, they're definitely going to take some of the energy of the plant. Um, goldenrods are such interesting plants. There are hundreds of insects that feed on them, and yet they still continue to bloom and survive and reproduce every year. If you're finding that, you know, the, the number of aphids that you're finding on your milkweeds, the, those, the aphids that I showed are oleander aphids, and they may get a little out of control. It's up to you. Um, you know, you can always, like I said, brush them off with your fingers or just use a spray of water. Many people I, you know, talk to do that too, if they don't like the number of aphids that they see. But just know that there are other insects out there helping you keep them in control. Yeah, and Alora, I can see you, you uh, tolerate them as long as somebody else is eating them. Um, Let's see. I see some advice on the emerald ash borer. We're, man, our, ours are dying. Uh, yeah. That is yeah. preserving the ash trees. Ours are dying big time, but we're trying to replant. Um, it's so important. The town I live in is Lambertville, New Jersey, and I live on the, it's surrounded by hills. I live on a hill, yay, I'm lucky. But people downhill from me experiencing, experience flooding quite frequently. So uh, we are trying to replant. Is it okay to dispose of dead perennial stems later in the spring? Well, you know, it's actually better to just let the new, um, new growth sort of surpass them and hide the, the old stems. You wouldn't even notice after a while. If it's really disturbing to you, then, you know, leave at least a few inches and either put what you've cut onto the ground or in a um, brush pile, that kind of thing. And then it's still a, available for use by critters, by insects. So, um, what else? I have a choke cherry, not a wild cherry. Is it a host? The, um, the cherries generally, excuse me, are um, good host plants for caterpillars, butterfly caterpillars, more than even just what I mentioned. Thank you all for joining us. We're going to end the chat now. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne.